Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. You know, some of you have been asking me to do the, a big box type review of EMI's, uh, what was EMI, Warner's Auto Klemperer Edition. Like, here it is. The problem was, and I hesitated, is because it's not an edition. It's, it's a bunch of boxes, about a dozen boxes. And, you know, there are all kinds of things that, for example, were on Testament, live things and other stuff. I'm hoping that at some point Warner will do a big Klemperer box and they will include not just the standard studio recordings, but also the radio recordings that he did in Cologne and in Vienna, you know, that were out on and the EMI Klemperer live stuff and, and then some of that Testament stuff. I mean, because there's just lots of it. And it really could be an extraordinary box. And they really ought not to bother doing this all over again unless they're really going to get serious and collect everything they can get their hands on. So while we're waiting, um, I'm not I'm not going to just, you know, keep us in suspense forever. I'm going to go through these Klemperer boxes because they deserve to be gone through. They're marvelous, most of them, and some of them, some of them are a little strange, especially as he got older and slower and older and slower. But uh, he was an amazing conductor, one of the great, great conductors of the 20th century. And of course, we must begin with Brahms, because Klemper was one of the two great Brahms people in existence. Well, three, well, no, in the 60s or the early 60s, at the beginning of the stereo era. Let's put it this way. Because before then, there was Toscanini, of course, who was a great Brahmsian most of the time. And, and also, you know, an occasional Fort Wengler, but most, he never did a cycle, actually. I mean, one continuous intentional cycle. They've cobbled things together from various places, but he never did all the symphonies. And, um, and he, for like, I mean, he played them all. Don't, don't come and get me for that. What I mean is, you know, what we have as the, the official Brahms cycle isn't really a Brahms cycle. So we can argue about that later if we talk about it later. But there were two great Brahmsians. Let's just get rid of that. Yes, thank you. Bruno Walter and Klemperer. They knew each other. They, they all came from the same rough, roughly general North German kind of place. Um, they were both Jewish. They both wound up fleeing Germany. Um, they were both old enough to have known Brahms, although they, they, they didn't particularly, but they, they were born to play that music. There's no question about it. And they played it very differently. Bruno Walter was, of the two, the, the more lyrical, um, perhaps the warmer, slightly more sentimental. Klemperer was the austere classicist with with a completely different timbral sense. I mean, it's wonderful, actually, because, you know, Walter was, was, was you know, the guy who you know, wanted warmth in the string playing, and Klemperer always emphasized woodwind parts. He wanted clarity, textural clarity. And so, and so they're wonderful to have and wonderful to compare. And this box of Brahms stuff is as good as it gets, period. No question about that. So let's just talk about what's in here, and we'll take it from there. It's basic usual stuff. We have the Haydn Variations, Symphony Number no. 1, <sighs> one of the all-time great, 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 great Brahms firsts. I mean, it's the, the performance that defined Klemperer's reputation and defined the term granitic, as in granite, as in carved from stone. It's an uncompromising, grand, truly, truly cosmic performance is phenomenal. Now, number two is just the opposite in terms of expressive point. It's much more lyrical and more flowing. And you'd think Walter, for example, would do it better, but not necessarily. Klemperer, for all his reputation for being slow and whatnot, was not terribly slow in this music. He was not. He was not slow in the Second Symphony. I mean, he's more measured in the finale than Bruno Walter, but there's no point at which he's stodgy at all. And, and he has such a fantastic sense of shape, of the arc of an entire movement. And the interesting thing about Klemper as a conductor is that he never played slow movements terribly slowly because he didn't want to sentimentalize them. So he tended to be quite flowing and, and perhaps even a little bit expressively um, contained in these movements. I wouldn't say there's nothing inexpressive about it, but, but he didn't, he didn't go for the, 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 you know, hard on sleeve stuff. And so he tended to keep slow movements moving rather smartly. And so he does here. It's a 
fantastic performance of the second. Now, the third, the third was a revelation. This was the first recording, the first major recording in like a billion years that actually took the first movement exposition repeat, um, which was almost never done in those days. He gave us a finale of uncompromising power, two fantastic central movements. I mean, it was one of the great thirds. And the third, of course, was always the symphony that even Brahmsians used to mess up. I mean, for example, Toscanini never got it. Fort Wengler, not really either. You couldn't get him to play it. He may have gotten it in some ways. You know, most people touch up the orchestration. They add timpani parts. They do things because, you know, the orchestration in some places is particularly dense and grotty, even for Brahms. But Klemperer just, just got it. He really got it. And it's a fantastic performance. The fourth is more controversial. The fourth is one of those works where where Klemperer um, indulged his, his, his pension, his occasional pension, for, um, well, how do I say? I wouldn't call it mannered. But, well, yes, in places it's mannered, actually. First movement's okay. Second movement is okay. Third movement has that luft pause, you know, da 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 now, that was a movement that you would think that Klemper would be at his granitic best for, but it's not that he's not at his best, he's just not granitic. The, the tempo is quite unusual. I mean, it has a, a, a stoicism um, about it, but also a, 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 a tempo kind of thing going that's quite unusual. It's very, very different. Some people don't like it at all. I think it's quite splendid, but, you know, I think all of his Brahms is quite splendid, so I'm not worried about it terribly, and, you know, you guys can make up your own minds. Then we've got the Academic Festival Overture, of course, and the Tragic Overture, which are terrific, absolutely terrific. I mean, you know, what do you expect? And the Alto Rhapsody, ooh, baby, with Crystal Ludwig, one of the great, 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 great Alto Rhapsodies. I mean, it's just phenomenal, and Ludwig is absolutely in top form. It's amazing. I mean, I talked to her about working with Klemperer, and she said oh, he was he was a character. He was definitely a character, she said. He was, you know, he liked to tell sort of off-color jokes. He was rather politically incorrect. He was very severe, very severe and, uh, you know, but he was he was marvelous. She had no idea how he managed to get the results he got from the orchestra, um, but he did. And then finally, there is the German Requiem, which is the reference recording for the German Requiem. The soloists there are Fischer Dieskau and Elisabeth Schwarzkopf with the Philharmonia Orchestra and Chorus. And it's just amazing. And it's not slow. Not slow. It's 69 minutes. I mean, it's, it's, it's not in any way one of the longer, more measured German Requiem. Because, like I said, Klemper was not a sentimentalist. He gave it a good tempo. And that second movement, Den alles Fleisch, es ist wie Gras. It's, wow. Ooh, is that scary. You know, with a big climax, the timpani going, da, dum, bum, 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 bum. it's amazing. And what's so amazing about it is because of Klemperer's emphasis on woodwind sonority at the, ex at the expense sometimes of the strings, um, and not a bad expense, I mean, just he just does it, you hear so much more color and texture in the orchestration of the German Requiem. You know, often it's just like a choral work where you've got a chorus and you've got like this jarred string body and they, they're they two kind of, you know, two kind of blobs of sound, but there are no blobs. Klemperer was not a blobulist. He wanted transparency. He wanted you to hear all those beautiful inner parts that Brahms wrote, but in natural balance. It's just amazing. Just amazing. So the Klemperer Brahms box is one of those things that's absolutely essential. And if you don't own it, then you are, you know, really losing and missing out on something extraordinary. It's phenomenal. So I look forward to doing the other boxes in this in this edition because they're going to get kind of interesting. I guarantee it, but I can't think of a better way to start. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care. <laughs>